Um, the first thing you notice about my book is that it's bright orange. Now, it was supposed to be red. Any of you who know City Year, we're known for our sort of signature bright red jackets. And the galleys were red, and I thought it was going to be red, and that sort of fit with, you know, the message of the book. But my editor called me one day, and he said, you know, we gave your book to the art department. Bill, you may have gone through this too, and they have a different idea. And I said, well, what is it? I said, well, we think you'll like it. We'll just send it to you in the mail. So I waited, you know, anxiously to get, to, to get the book in the mail. I opened it up, and I said, whoa, I've got a bright orange book. And I showed it to my wife, who's wonderful. She said, well, orange is a really nice color. And, you know, after a while, I realized there's actually some really good uses for a bright orange book. You know, if you get an extra copy and you keep it in your car, and it's kind of dark here on the Cape at night and you break down, you don't need any flares. You know, or if you have young kids like I do, and sometimes they're afraid of the dark, you don't need to worry about night lights. Just stick a copy of Big Citizenship in their room. So Halloween, we had Halloween recently. My kids were carrying it around with their, with their jack-o'-lanterns. But, um, but the truth is, uh, my editors and publisher were right. I, I, you know, I'm thinking of myself more as an activist and a doer, not a writer or an author. And you can't miss the book when you walk into a bookstore. So I do get a kick out of it um, whenever I see it. They knew what they were doing. You can't miss it. Uh, I wrote the book, uh, first and foremost, out of a sense of gratitude. Because what I've found is that beyond meeting my extraordinary wife, Vanessa Kirsch, and the birth of my two kids, there's been nothing that's been more rewarding or fulfilling in my life than having a dream to try to want to make a difference and then to work with other people who you share values with and ideals and to see that dream become true. The next step in my journey happened on September 8th, 1979. And that's when I first met Michael Brown, who Bill knows well. We were assigned to be roommates as freshmen in college. And I don't know who put us together, but they certainly knew what they were doing. We both found out right away that we sort of had a, a passion for the 60s and the icons of the 60s, JFK and Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King, uh, and what they stood for. And, and we also, after about a week, confessed to each other that we were both Trekkies. We both loved the show Star Trek because it was the the most idealistic show on television. You know, they had this very diverse crew on the Bridge of the Starfish. I see some Trekkies nodding their heads, I like that. Um, uh, the Bridge of the Starship Enterprise, you know, had this very diverse crew. The Russians and Americans were working together. Everything had been solved and they were boldly going where no one had gone before. And Michael and I both found out that we had a passion for trying to make a difference and that we loved America. And so we started talking about this idea of national service. And eventually came, you know, after some time, uh, which I talk about more in the book, came to, the, to this idea that we should try to start this program called City Year for young people to spend a year, uh, you know, just so you do a junior year, senior year, do a city year where the city could be your classroom and homeless shelters and after school programs and public schools could be your textbooks and you could learn by doing and learn by giving and giving back. Uh, and, but I share that because City Year first and foremost is the story of a really great friendship and a great partnership and people often come to me and say, you know, I have an idea for an organization or I want to start something what should I do? I always say find a partner and build a team. Nobody changes the world by themselves. Nobody can make a difference. I love the fact that, that there are so many key club people here. And if you talk to them, I'm sure they'd say what's, what's great about it is that it's a club and people are in it together. Um, and so I tell that story. And we started in Boston with just 50 people. And our idea behind City Year was to give 17 to 24 year olds a chance to spend that year making a difference and showing that this idea of national service could work. Our, our thought was that we would be a model, but even more be an action tank. Part of the, the idea behind my book is to share some strategies for change that I've been able to work on. And the idea behind an action tank was in 1987, 88, when we were starting City Year, at that time, there were a lot of think tanks that were writing about the idea of national service, mostly based in Washington. Well, here's what it could do and the difference it could make and how you could make it work. And then there were a bunch of programs at the grassroots level who were sort of doing service in different ways. And so Michael and I said, well, we've got to bring those two together. We'll have an action tank. We'll actually take the theory and design a program to sort of meet that theory as an action-oriented example, with the hope being that people would see that and say, hey, this should work. This could be national. Um, you know, could you have service bring people together from different backgrounds? How could you pay for it? Would the private sector be willing to help pay for it? Could young people who are 17, 18, 19, 20, do anything of real value, even though they hadn't, didn't have a lot of experience. Um, how could you get a community engaged? Should it come from the top down or the grassroots up? All these issues. And so we started City Year 
really to try and demonstrate this idea, and we got lucky. We were here in Massachusetts, so Senator Kennedy took an interest in us right from the beginning, given his, his own commitment and his family's commitment to service. Greg Petersmeyer, who worked for President Bush 41, got very interested. He was the first director of national service in the White House. We were so excited there was actually somebody with that title. And he met with us within 30 days of taking office and then visited, and then Senator Kennedy and, and President Bush 41 did a first national service bill. And we got named a demonstration program. And then our big break came when President Clinton, when he was Governor Clinton campaigning for president, stopped at City Year on his way up to New Hampshire and spent the better part of a day with us. And, you know, he was just blown away by the young people he met. One story I like to share with people about the campaign. It was Saturday night. It was about 10 days before the primary, uh, about midnight. And I'd been campaigning all day long. And I was home, and I, my brother Lance had come out from California, lived on my couch for three months to help me out, put his career on hold. And we were watching a docu documentary about Bobby Kennedy, who's my political hero. So I figured I got 10 days left. I got to get some inspiration from Bobby. So I'm watching this documentary with Lance, and my cell phone rang. And so I looked, I'm thinking, God, it's almost midnight. Who's calling me? I looked at the caller ID. It was my campaign manager. So now I'm thinking, oh my God, what disaster could have happened that Kelly's calling me at midnight on a Saturday? Uh, so I answered the phone. I said, hi, Kelly, what's up? And she said, well, are you sitting down? And I thought, oh boy, here it comes. And so, yes, I'm sitting down. What's going on? And she said, well, the Boston Globe just endorsed you, and it came out online. So I start screaming, high-fiving my brother. We're, you know, making lots of noise celebrating. Wake up my wife, Vanessa, who comes down the stairs. Uh, and she's hugging me, and we're, you know, celebrating. And finally, we woke up my little girl, Mirabelle, who was seven at the time. So my daughter comes down, you know, half asleep in her stocking feet in her nightgown, and her proud daddy picks her up, and I put her on my lap, and she said, Daddy, Daddy, what's all the noise about? And I said, well, honey, the Boston Globe just said your dad would be the best senator. And she looked at me, and she said, I already knew that. Can I just go back to sleep now? <laughs> so the one thing I tell people is, you know, if you ever decide to run for office, your kids will keep you grounded, your friends will keep you grounded. My wife was extraordinary the whole time, but, but it, they, they do keep you grounded. But from all of this, I share all this with you because I've also come to a point of view from all of these experiences I've been privileged to be a part of. Big citizenship at the micro level is sort of that challenge from Harry Truman. What can each of us do to try to make a difference? But what I'm also trying to do with the book is spark a conversation about how we can have a new approach to solving problems in our country. And so big citizenship is also an attempt to spark that debate, to lay out a, a new approach, a new philosophy, if you will. I don't feel like I have all the answers by any means, but I think we need to have a different kind of discussion and debate. We just finished an election two weeks ago. Uh, and you know, one of the universal things is people are turned off and they feel like politics isn't speaking to them. And I think it's because the debate in Washington has become so, so partisan, but also so simple. One side says, well, government's the answer. The other side says, no, you're all wrong. Government's the problem. And it's more complicated than that, and people know it's more complicated than that. And so what I'm trying to say with big citizenship, based on all these experiences I've had, is that we need a new approach. First of all, we need an economy that works for everybody. I felt that viscerally when I was campaigning myself a year ago. We have to restore America as the country that my dad came to and my Italian grandparents as the place of opportunity and of the American dream. Secondly, whenever we have a challenge or an opportunity, we've got to look to citizens. What role can citizens play in making a difference in trying to seize this opportunity? For me, I'd love to see, you know, this, the Serve America Act will bring AmeriCorps to 250,000 people. I'd love to see it get to a million people a year and unleash the energy and idealism of people all over this country to try and solve our problems. But it also means getting everybody involved in politics and in movements, and I'll come back to that. Thirdly, it's innovators and entrepreneurs that drive change. And this is both in the private sector and in the public sector. You know, here in Massachusetts, we invented the first public school. We also invented the first computer and the first telephone. And, it's, and I learned this when I was campaigning. It's going to be the clean energy entrepreneurs that, that free us from fossil fuel oil, Mideast oil. It's the social entrepreneurs in the education space that are driving change. It's entrepreneurs and innovators. And we need a system that can help take these innovations to scale more rapidly. That means we also need a new role for 21st century government. I, I don't, I'm not an anti-government person. I think that, that we need an active government, but it's got to have the right role. And in the 21st century, I think government should be more catalytic, more transparent, more accountable. It should help to set the rules of the game so that there's a fair marketplace. It should help to take things to scale that work, but also be willing to shut things down that don't. 